just a horrible, horrible experience gets even worse because I step on that beehive. Hey everyone, John here from the Cast and Sphere podcast, and today we have a very special guest. His name is Luke Ofgard. He's from the site Caught Ofgard, and he is one of the best trout fishermen I've ever met. Super cool guy, has just fishing in his blood. And in this podcast, he's going to share with you probably one of the craziest fishing stories I've ever heard. I'm surprised this guy's still alive after all the stuff that he went through. And then at the very end, he's going to share with you a little bit about his pedigree, all the awards that he's kind of won in the trout fishing space, and the impressive number of species he's caught. But before we get started, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a future episode. And without further ado, let's please welcome Luke Ofgard. I was born and raised in Klamath Falls, and growing up, I wasn't really sure what that meant or if that was even a good thing. But as I got a little older and really got into fishing, I realized that Klamath Falls was a great place to grow up. In fact, the Klamath Basin is arguably the best uh, wild native trout fishery in the lower 48, certainly the best wild native rainbow trout fishery. The only places on earth that are any better are going to be in Alaska, in like the Tierra del Fuego, down in Patagonia. And honestly, I've fished New Zealand and the Klamath Basin is better than that. So it's an awesome place to live. It's an awesome place to grow up. And once you accept that, hey, you know, we might have not have all the best food options in the world and we don't have a mall, you know, but we have more than enough trout fishing to make up for it, then you, t- then you sort of try to take the most of that. And so what I did um, is what I do every fall. It was October and October on the Klamath river is, is one of the most beautiful places and one of the best fishing experiences you'll ever have. Basically it's about 25 minutes out of Klamath falls in a little town called Kino. You're going to drive and you're going to park not too far from the power line, wherever you can find parking along the shoulder of the highway. And then you're going to hike down. It's a couple miles down the hill and it's not an easy hike. It's not for someone who's in terrible shape, but you don't have to be in phenomenal shape either. So it's something that is accessible to everybody, but it's definitely something that's not for the faint of heart. And I decided I was going to go down there. And it was one of those years where here in, here in Southern Oregon, it's, it's still pretty warm in October most of the time, especially early October. And so I was down there. I use, usually wear board shorts and either a t-shirt or a tank top and then tennis shoes and, and sort of wet weight it because it's just more of a enjoyable experience to me. And the river can be pretty dangerous. So you don't want to have waders because when you inevitably fall, which is going to happen, you don't want them to fill up. So I started walking down the hill and it was like any other day. I was having a good time walking down and uh, started catching fish just like I always had. It was pretty awesome. I was really excited. And that, that year in particular had been really good. I was doing about 20 to 50 fish a trip. And these are fish that are between, you know, usually on average about 10 to 20 inches, but really thick. So uh, a 20 incher is going to be for sure at the three pound mark, maybe even a little bit more. So it's really motivating high volume of fish. They're big fish. They fight well, they're healthy. It's just a great experience. And it just so happened that I decided to go down to the river that day after I went to the gym and it was back when I still worked out a lot and I'd done leg day the day before. So I was a little sore and I, I sort of run down to the canyon because it's, it's, I don't know, it just makes me feel a little more hardcore when I'm running down that trail. And so I did that and I get down and the flows were about what I was expecting. Um, low enough that you could wade, but not, not low enough that you probably should wade. And so I, I figured, you know what, I'll, I'll wade at the shallowest place. So I walk down and after I'd been fishing for a while, I get to this point where I want to wade across the river to go fish this little section that doesn't get a whole lot of pressure. And so I'm making my way across and two steps in, I'm, I'm thinking, man, this was, this was a bad life choice. I'm really sore. Hopefully I can handle it. But by that point it was too late. So I take another step and I just eat it. Um, <laughs> I, I fall in and it, it was not a good thing. And I'm thinking, man, this is really bad. This river's really flowing. There's some huge boulders ahead. So fortunately, I've been around the river enough. I knew to, you know, kick my feet out in front of me. And I sort of let the current take me until I was able to scramble back up onto my feet, sort of doggy paddle and trip my way across the river. I'm beat up, you know, I'm bruised, I'm bloody, but I made it to the other side. And that was, (laughs) that was a good start. So I get over there and I, I put my feet And I put my hands down on this island. I'm sort of panting on all fours. I make it across. 
I stand up and I'm like, well, you know, I made it across. I didn't die. So this is a good thing. I'm going to try and fish. And so right as I stand up, I look down and I'm, I'm cold and wet and shivering. And I, I go to wipe this floating piece of weed that had landed on my leg. And I look and there's a bee on my leg. And I'm thinking, oh man, that, that kind of sucks. So I wipe it off and another one lands on my leg. And, and before I know it, I'm like standing in a yellow jacket hive and they are just stinging me. They're going to town. They're on my legs, on my neck, my hair. And of course, since my, <laughs> I'm wearing thin board shorts and a soaked t-shirt now, so it didn't even matter if they were on my clothes, they were still getting their stings through. So just a horrible, horrible experience gets even worse because I step on that beehive. So I'm running away. I, I have the presence of mind to hold on to my rod and my net, but I'm like sprinting away from where I'd just been stung. And I'm on this rough sort of rocky island with a lot of weeds and, and thick cattails. I'm sort of tripping as I'm trying to run away. And then I realized that my lure somehow had, stat, had snagged right into the grass where I was. These bees are still on me. I'm stinging. I finally get everything off. I'm, I'm finally done being stung. And then I realize I have to go back and get this hook, which is snagged in the ground right where the bees are. And, oh man, I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I should have just cut the line, but like the idiot that I was, I decided to go back and I, I was able to work the lure free. It was not a good, good experience. Um, if you've ever been stung by, you know, 20 or 30 bees at once, the, the poison, the venom really starts to have an effect. Not only, even if you're not allergic, when you get that many bee stings, your whole body it aches, but it's in like these surging, racking waves of pain. Um, not, not like a constant ache, but like it feels like someone's hitting you or pinching you and it, it'll, it'll surge at moments. And if it happens to surge all at once, I mean, it, it can honestly cripple you. It sort of like brings you to your knees. And most of the, the stings were on my legs and on my face and neck. And so I was, I was miserable and I'm thinking, man, <laughs> this day could not get any worse. Now I'm across the river from where I need to be. But the pain started to subside a little bit. It got colder. I think the numbing um, from the water helped a little bit. So I thought, all right, well, I'm going to keep fishing. So I did. And I, I caught a, a few more fish until I got a fish hooked in a way that, that was just sort of difficult to get it unsnagged. And in the whole debacle, I'd lost my pliers. So I'm like, I'll, I'll just grab it. So I, I tried to grab one of the hooks to unhook the fish. And it was a pretty good sized fish. And so it thrashed and it got free, but it embedded two of the trebles in my Rapala up to the shank in my finger. And so I'm just like, come on, you know, I'm looking at the sky. I'm like, I, I should have, right? But, you know, I didn't. And uh, so <laughs> I, I saw this trick online where if you like, wrap a loop of line around a hook, you can pull it in a way where it'll pop the hook out. And that works great if you're not dealing with barbless hooks, which I was. And so I finally, after a ridiculous amount of reefing on myself, I was able to get both the, the hooks out. But by this time I'm gushing blood, I'm covered in bee stings, I'm sopping wet, I'm freezing. And I'm just thinking, man, this is, this is the worst. So I finally at this point decide, yeah, I, sh I should probably go back. And I do. And it's, you know, about 20 minutes before I'm even close to the trail where I needed to be about an hour before I'm back in my car, I'm bleeding. Um, I'm, I'm soaked. I have a horrible headache from all the bee stings. That was probably the closest I'd ever gotten in my life to dying. Um, <laughs> and, and so many times in, in one day, uh, I ended up having a, a black eye. My, my face was almost swollen shut the next day. I couldn't really see because of all the bee stings. Um, my, my hand was jacked up for the longest time. I couldn't type at work my bruises and cuts and, and everything from being kicked down the river basically pretty much encouraged me that I probably didn't want to, to do that again. And yet a week later I went back to the same place and, you know, put myself through that sort of torture again. So, no, it, that didn't happen twice. That that was the worst. But there was another time I, I stepped on a bees bees hive down there. Same thing, yellow jacket. I see it st land on my wrist. I'm like, oh crap! So I slap it. And in that case, that one was actually recently feeding on some sort of dead animal. So that one got infected. I still have a a huge scar on my wrist. 
Um, <laughs> I've fallen, I've, I've sheared off parts of my body in that river. Um, I lost like half an inch on my shin when I slipped and scraped it off on a rock. I've dropped a few rods in that place. It, it was basically the, the trial by fire for me to become, you know, a serious angler. I lost a lot of blood, sweat and tears in that river, but you know, it was, it was worth it. Now I've got it down to a science. Um, this year I went down there on opening day, fished four hours cause that's all the time I had. I had a friend's wedding and I landed 69 fish in those four hours, all of them between, you know, 10 and 20 inches. And there's nowhere else on earth where you can do that. I'm pretty much speechless at this point. <laughs> you just showed me that fishing is a full contact sport, man. That's intense. It really is. It really is. Well, how did you like that story? Wasn't it just insane? Here, Luke's going to go into a little bit about his background in fishing and how you can reach out to him. I am a resident here in Southern Oregon. My day job is a teacher. I, I teach high school business. Um, I love to write about fishing almost as much as I like to fish. And I've been fishing my entire life. Really, really started to take it seriously back in 2004. My friend's dad basically sat me down and said, hey, I, I keep a journal when I go hunting and fishing. And from there, it evolved into you know me keeping track of every fish I caught from that day forward. It evolved into my blog, uh, caughtoffguard.com. That's C-A-U-G-H-T. My last name, Ofgard, O-V-G-A-R-D.com. Check it out. That's how I got started writing. Now I've written a newspaper column for my local newspaper about fishing for five years I've been writing for Game and Fish magazine for a few months. I've been privileged enough to be able to travel around with Fishbrain. If you haven't used, utilized Fishbrain, you definitely need to. I'm one of their ambassadors. It's basically Instagram for fishing, but so much more. And in my time fishing, um, I've been privileged enough to catch now almost 13,000 fish, I'm currently sitting over a little bit over 12,211. I have over 206 species to my name. I have two all-tackle world records. I've registered five trout grand slams, which is three or more species in the same day of trout. I've actually done it about 20 times, but I've only registered five of them because it's, it's not cheap and you need a witness. And I actually have one super grand slam. I also caught a tiger trout that day, which would have been five different species in the same day, but they don't count tigers, unfortunately. And I live to fish and I want to share those adventures with you. So check out my blog, caughtoffguard.com, and hopefully we can learn a little bit together. All right, that does it for this episode of the podcast. Can you believe we're already at episode 22? I feel like we just started this the other day. How are we doing? And I, I want to know, if you have any recommendations, go to castandspear.com forward slash contact and tell me. If you have something you want to hear that we haven't covered so far, let me know and I'll go make sure it happens. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a future episode. And even better, or maybe on top of that, if you have three fishing buddies who you think would enjoy this as well, please send them a text, send them a note, send them, you know, a pigeon with a thing that you write on a little letter. You know, anything helps grow this podcast. I want to make this the best podcast for fishing on the web. And with that, keep those lines tight, everyone. See ya.